Hello and welcome back to Bourbon Barrel Talk. I'm your host, Scott Minton. Today we are at the Starlight Distillery at the Huber's and Orchard and Winery Farm in uh, southern Indiana. Um, today with us we have uh, Mr. Christian Huber, Ted Huber, and uh, James Wood, their marketing guru. Is that correct? Uh, brand and sales manager technically, yeah. but... I'm in the ballpark, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so fellas, how are we doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Christian. Very well. Yeah, good. yeah. It's been a great day. Good, good, good. So for those of us from the Louisville, Southern Indiana area, we obviously are very familiar with, you know, what you guys have been doing up here for years and, and creating such a great product and things to that nature. Um, however, I think one of the hidden gems for Southern Indiana is obviously the Starlight Distillery. You guys have been in business for quite a little bit of time, and you are probably the lesser-known entity of the Huber Orchard and Winery. Could you tell us a little bit about how the Starlight Distillery came about? Well, Christian, I'll take this. Um, as sixth generation, Christian being seventh generation, uh, we go back to Germany uh, during the Rhine River region. Uh, as our ancestors came over here, we started vineyards and orchards, started distillery and winery, producing different products up here in Starlight, Indiana. Uh, perfect location up here for growing fruits and vegetables and et cetera through there. So the wine industry and the distilling industry did quite well back in the 1800s. Uh, we jump to Prohibition, and you, and, you, and you see this kind of pushback of alcohol here in this part of the Midwest. A lot of issues in Indiana, a lot of different things. It, it was really my father's generation that really got the wine industry started back in the 1970s. Uh, and the beer and, and the distilling did not come with it. Uh, it was really wine back in the 70s and 80s. That's what Indiana did. Uh, and then the beer industry got started. Still no distillery. You know, the distillery industry just did not uh, move forward. And then about the mid-90s, or actually it was early uh, 90s, my grandma really started pushing me about getting the, the distillery back going. She taught me how to distill uh, in the January of 1984. Taught me the old family recipe of, of distilling Applejack. Uh, here on the farm of, of what it was and then and then I got really focused on wine my dad was teaching me wine and really got going down the wine bug and I really loved that uh, but grandma kept you know pushing you know you really need to start distilling so let, let me uh, ask one real quick question sorry to interrupt how old were you when your grandma started teaching you to make apple I was a sophomore in high school not 16 yeah I was 15 years old and I made a 50 gallon barrel of applejack that's a good grandma uh, and I, and uh, the, the thing was the 50 gallon barrel was cool because it was full but i had like jugs of other stuff uh and uh i, I, I turned 16 in february and we started driving and we had all this 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 nice alcohol running around it was good applejack and uh, uh to move forward with it you know we we really knew that uh, the the huber and starlight and the floyd knobs area had such a rich history up here in producing spirits uh, and we really started working with our legislators up in Indiana to try to get things to move forward. But, you know, uh, all of us that live in the Midwest know how slow things move legislatively. And we just got to prove ourselves and do things. And, and, and we finally kind of got to where we needed to be uh, in the late 90s. So we introduced a, beer, a, a bill. Uh, to kind of get things moving forward for distillation. You know, the beer industry was going, the wine industry was going good, everything was going good. Uh, and we just kind of hit a couple of stumbling points into uh, a good old southern Indiana, Frank O'Bannon, uh, became our governor right down here in Cordon, Indiana. And we're like, Frank, I said, you know, you know everything down here. You know, why why don't we have distilleries? And he's like, well, I don't know. Why, why don't we? I said, well, we, we don't have a law that allows us to have it. And so, you know, Frank kind of took that under his wing and really, you know, really pushed it. We had several other legislators down here in Southern Indiana said the same thing. I said, you know, there's a rich history in Indiana. And so they passed that bill and, and we got it done in 2001. Which going from 1998 to 2001 to pass a bill like that is is in Indiana is, is a very quick, uh, quick move. But at, at at that time it was brandy only, and the reason was that because I was pushing the bill and we had a winery and they're like, okay, you make wine, you have a farm that grows fruit, fruit makes wine, wine distilled makes brandy and so that's why from 2001 to 2013 starlight distillery only made brandy because that's the law that we were operating under so you started what in 2013 2013 uh you know jump forward uh to more legislation this is where christian and his brother blake comes into play because they're a little bit older 
And we, we never wanted just to play in the brandy world, uh, but we, don't, we wanted to play in the craft distiller world. We wanted to be a real, true craft distiller crafting things. And as everybody knows here in southern Indiana and Indiana in general, what grows everywhere? Corn. Corn. Yeah, you guys got, yeah, you know, and we're like, wow, you know, we got all these cornfields, you know, we have all these vineyards and orchards, but look at all these cornfields there where we should be making whiskey. You know, there's a whiskey industry around this area, and, you know, we don't want to talk south of the river in Kentucky, but there's a rich whiskey industry here in uh, in this region. And, and we have some beautiful pieces of property that's really, you know, really good for growing some really cool corns. And so we started lobbying, you know, at that time, Mitch Daniels was our governor, and he was like, okay, I'm, I'm good with it, good with it. Give give me a good bill, but we just never could get anything through the public policy, little alcohol issues going on back at that time period. Uh, and then and we changed from Mitch Daniels to uh, – our current vice president of the United States came into office, and he's like, okay, let's, let's see if we can't get this bill through. Uh, and uh, nothing against either one of the two guys, but, you know, the things things lined up for us in 2013, which was odd that it, they lined up that year. But we got the craft distiller bill through that particular year, which allowed us to go ahead and get into, like, vodka, whiskey. We can distill anything uh, that our federal license, our TTB license, allowed us to do. Must have had some really good tax opportunities in there for them to push that through and make it happen. Well, I think the, if you think about what was going on in the beer industry and the wine industry at that time, I mean, it was flourishing throughout the state. There was wineries in every district, uh, breweries in everywhere, and we're like, you know, it's just, you know, there's Huber down here and a few other distilleries and a big MGP over there, and it's like, why you know these beer industries, these beer, these breweries, and these wineries are bringing these small communities. They're becoming hubs for these small. You know why can't a distillery do the same thing? And economically, it, that's what they were looking at. They were really looking at, you know, it's an agricultural product. I mean, Indiana again is corn. We all we all said it almost at the same time. And why can't Indiana make some some really cool bourbons and cool grains since we grow them? So uh, you referenced. This local, you know, small town area, we've got all this great agriculture. And when you go across the river to that other side of the mighty Ohio, the one thing they always want to tell you about is water. So every time we've been on one of these distillery tours, uh, they talk about water and how great their limestone water is. And I mostly think it's a crock of crap, but... um, (laughs) What kind of what do you all think? Where do you get your water from out here, and how do you think it impacts? Well, the water water is you know it's one of the most most important ingredients when it comes to it. But the cool thing about it, the as the water comes out of north coming south, the 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 majority of it runs on the Indiana side of the river, and we have more pure limestone on the Indiana side of the river. You know what is all of our government buildings in Washington D.C. built out of? Not Kentucky limestone, Indiana limestone. I mean, we have pure really cool water so we're, we're sitting on these deep escarpments and so we're just pulling our beautiful water right out of there and that's going right into our mash uh and going right into our finished barrel projects too so we're very fortunate to live in this part of the world so we're we really you know we don't you know i love to hear my other uh counterparts and craft distillers that are trucking water in from this area that's this beautiful lake or this beautiful thing and they're they're bringing this water in because it is that important but for all of us living in southern Indiana, I mean, the water is here and it's everywhere, and you just have to you just have to tap into it, get it filtered, and put it right into your whiskey, and it does the thing. So much of them will tell you about you know the limestone water and the quality of it, and then you see that they're pulling it straight out of the tap. So you just got to ask, you know, where is it actually coming from? Are you guys pulling out of your own well? No, we're not pulling our we're pulling out of the tap too because we're pulling it right out of the Borden Tri County water. It's coming right over there at the lake and we're pulling it right in and we're we're doing a filtration on it and pulling it right out of there uh, it's, the, it's the best tasting the highest quality water you possibly could be we just have to make sure we take the things they add to it back out of it and one thing we do on a tour and, and Christian and James are here one of our f- favorite things to do when tours are coming through is actually go over to the uh, to the water and tap the water and let people taste water I mean just the pure water coming out of what we're doing not the, out of the tap because that will have your fluoride and your chlorine and, but coming out of the system that we're using and to taste that quality of water so we're not we're not you know, hiding behind a curtain telling people that we have these beautiful wells or something we're pulling off of this. No, we're just pulling it right out of the Borden Tri-County water system here 
uh, and bringing the water and filtering it right through and coming up with the beautiful water that we're using. No, we do have wonderful water here in southern Indiana, and it's great tasting water. Uh, I think we don't typically put it up against all the taste tests on the other side of the river, but it is excellent water. Well, I just I, I, I invite you one time. We we're having a, a group from California or New York or other crazy places that are coming through here doing barrel tastings with us and picking barrels out. And we're like, you know, we're talking about this. I said, come over here and just try this. We'll just dip it right out of our water and taste the water. And I'm like, oh, my God, yeah, that's our water that's coming from our municipality. So are you all the biggest user for board in Tri County? I I don't I can't answer that question. We use a lot of water here because I mean what we what we do on a daily basis is incredible, uh, and and uh, but we are an advocate for them, um, for uh, for the quality that they're doing. Sure. So I want to jump back and just cover one thing real quick today. So and after that we'll go straight deep into bourbon. We were supposed to be here about two months ago, and then COVID nineteen hit. Uh, so we were supposed to be doing a podcast with you a couple months ago and it was like the week that everybody shut down, school started mm-hmm. shutting down, state started shutting down. Uh, but I had the opportunity to see you guys pop up on, uh, lots of local media stations because you guys were, were doing things, giving back to the community. You want to tell just a little bit about what happened for the last two months and then we'll dive right back into the good brown water. Yeah, of course. I mean, no doubt that the public health crisis and this uh, pandemic has put us very slow down on what we're doing in distillation. Um, but distilleries had a rare opportunity to step up to the plate. Um, for us, it was very easy to turn off our mash into producing what would be bourbon into hand sanitizer. Uh, we were one of the first distilleries as a family to get in the Louisville metro area with our hand sanitizer. Um, so what we were doing is basically centering it up um, into basically a light whiskey stage. Um, kind of proofing that up, taking all those oils out, getting the alcohol higher. Um, we partnered with a local pharmacist to get us glycerol and hydrogen and hydrogen peroxide. Um, so when it came down to it, I mean, our distillery and family was, it was a quick, easy decision saying Thursday we were running bourbon and the very next day we we're running hand sanitizer and haven't stopped yet. Um, I believe after this week we've produced over 10,000 gallons for uh, the Louisville Metro in Southern Indiana. And that's going to hospitals, that's going to the first responders from police, fire, EMS, um, nursing homes, and the whole nine yards who's been affected, including the school boards. Um, kids who uh, haven't been able to have that school lunch, uh, we partnered with the school board down there to be able to have their clean tables so they actually come in and they can still eat for the for the community. So it's a... It was a it was a big blessing for us. Um, currently, like I said, we're over ten thousand gallons of it, um, and we still have more to produce. I mean, until this public health crisis is uh, can, under control and the uh, proper PPE is out there, we'll still be producing it. Um, we've since been able to, uh, as resources came back into Louisville, kind of slow down the production of it and got it back on track with our bourbon mash bill. Um, but we always have ready reserves now that we can easily pull from and make. Thank you on behalf of the community for that, because I know I saw it everywhere, whether it was on TV or saw the bottles with the stickers out in uh, municipalities or school places. Uh, Great service to the community. Yeah, absolutely. Matter of fact, I was just at a... I had a flat tire and was at Big O, and they're like, here's some, some Starlight Distillery, you know, hand sanitizer. I was like, how cool is that? And it was, literally was pulling it right out of a five-gallon bucket. I guess they had a hose ran to it or something of that nature. So, yeah, absolutely. Thank you guys so much for what you did um, to the community to, to support us in, in this such a weird time. So let's get back into brown water, which is what we're all here to talk about. Uh, so wait, 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 Josh, before you get started here, they were nice enough to start the day off with this single barrel Huber's bottle and bond. It's a hundred and proof, hundred proof, uh, bourbon whiskey finished in a sherry cask barrel. So, uh, I, I took a hit of this and it, it, it's a pretty daggone tasty product. Um, and the, the viscosity, I know Toby loves the word viscosity or viscosity cause, uh, he seems to think that's what I say all the time. Um, I was really surprised at, you know, how much it had to it with just being a hundred proof. So, so this is a Oloroso sherry cask. Yeah. So, um, kind of as a production uh, set of things, as we're getting four or five, six and seven year old bourbons, uh, we were able to partner with an importer for these, uh, these casks, having a wine background, uh, me and my brother, uh, Blake both graduated from viticulture enology. Um, so study great growing, study a winemaking, 
Um, so we're we're going down to this importer and smelling each individual cask. Um, and you'd be surprised on how many casks down there will have VA or have um, different reductions with it, so not making it as pure. Um, and some distilleries who really don't know how to smell for those wine faults pick these barrels up and not really what it, how it impacts their actual bourbon overall. Um, for instance, me and my brother was down there. We smelt 60, uh, 60 some odd barrels of Oloroso, and we found four that we really, really enjoyed for this project. Um, they're all first fills, so no second fills. First fill, pulling out that dark, rich color. Uh, for us, it gives it a layer of depth, and uh, use, you use the word viscosity. It gives it a weight and has a, this little, in the bridge when you do taste, it has this little mid palette that just pops. Uh, we're a high rye mash bill in this particular blend. Um, so having that nice citrus rye pop, it has that like baking spice to it. Um, so the Oloroso really complements it on that kind of side of things. Um, it was a really cool collaboration that has uh, really gotten the market. Um, James can speak on the uh, behalf of the Whiskey Vault. Um, we actually just got a, the score back from uh, Wine Spectre. Again, they got a 91 points out there. Um, so it was a really, really cool project. And we have many more on the way from so turn that we did with bourbon charity coming up and uh i don't know if i was allowed to talk about that but it's coming on out um as well as um apple finished or apple brandy finished rye all the way to port as well as uh, a 10 year old peach brandy that's been um been dumped and bottled and now we have bourbon back into it as well chris you might you might uh talk about this particular whiskey because you and your brother blake went outside of the normal protocol and did a bottle of the bond. Normally we do barrel finishing. We, we, we go through a, a, a multiple year, uh, some older whiskey with some younger whiskey, put it back into there. But this particular one, the bottle of the bond project, they actually went to one particular season of producing uh, the bourbon. So it's going to be from one corn source, one rye source, and one wheat source, and one barley source. Uh, and then they picked, they put, uh, they did this particular pick this way. Yeah, we uh, we wanted to highlight the individuality and uh, kind of have fun with the law when it comes to bottled and bar. Right. It's and a this very- is this is something we don't normally do because my 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 palate would said that I wanted to have this more complex blend. <laughs> so last summer. The two boys are home from college, and, and they're sitting there saying, well, Dad, just do this, this. I said, no, let's grab these and that. These are, well, if we do this one particular scheme that we have over here, this could be a bottled in bond. Uh, and so uh, that's what they decided to do, and that's why you see the very unusual finish bottled in bond, which are not very many of out in the marketplace. Well, and it comes back to it. I mean, when we were growing up in the distillery, me and my brother, um, of course, we were training the winemaking side of things, but we were also growing up as our brandy distillery was coming up. Um, so reading the laws that were set by um, Indiana for brandy, reading the bottle and bond clause, and then getting into the craft um, distilling clause for grain, um, we were able to basically learn from all that and become a distiller at a very young age. Um, Dad, I beat you by about a year and a half because I did my very first barrel of Applejack when I was the day I turned 13 years old. So the day I turned 13 was the day I first made my first barrel of uh, brandy. Same with my brother. Um, so when it came down to it, we were able to train our palates really early on. Um, and we wanted to show people how unique and geeky you can get um, with the bottle and bond clause. Um, so we went out there and uh, selected casts that fit from the same distilling season. Of course, everything we do here is distilled here um, in our in our uh, facility. So we were able to put bottle and bond on that, as well as put it into a single sherry cask and take it back out, which still fits the bottle and bond. So tell me this. I mean, it sounds like a pretty fun, dynamic father-son opportunity here. And, and to me, that's really cool to have that, that experience. How many times has he pissed you off because he did something you didn't want to do? <laughs> as long as he doesn't lose money, it doesn't really. You know, there, there, there are a lot of opportunities. And currently right now, the boys and I, and James comes with us occasionally, that we go out to the warehouse on a, on a rainy afternoon and we'll pull a 60-barrel block down uh, and we'll do an evaluation on that block. Um, we'll rate it from one to 100, and we'll do different things and and put them into the books that way. And and uh, it can get to be a very heated discussion, to put it mildly. Uh, we don't want anybody recording the the f bombs and other things that are going on between us because uh, between the three of us, we're we're all three very uh, trained in what we do. 
And so we all trust our palates, uh, and we have different opinions about what's going on. And so when it, when when we the, these Oloroso barrels, by the way, were twelve hundred dollars for the empty barrel. And so when the boys came to me and said, you know, we, we really want to do this Oloroso finished barrel, we want to buy four of these barrels. I'm like, yeah, okay, that's five grand, right there. And then we want to take some really good whiskey. Some really, really, I'm talking about some damn good whiskey that we could have really sold very easily and said, then we're going to take that and going to put it in there for six months to a year and going to, you're not going to be able to sell it. So we're going to spend five grand and then we're going to take whiskey away from what should be going to the market to help pay for making more whiskey. Uh, and, uh, and then we're going to set it back. I'm like, all right, let's, it's just, and that's why they went down to pick the barrels. I'm like, we're not going to spend that kind of money unless you guys go down and nose these barrels and bring these barrels back. And then when they brought them back, I like, well, that, that is incredible. So let's go out to the warehouse now. These barrels are, you know, I spent five grand on them. They're expensive. Um, and I'm like, let's, let's, let's go there and uh, let's, uh, let's put the perfect whiskey into it. So I'm over here tasting six-year whiskey and five-year. And they're like, oh, no, no, no. Let's put something more forward. So we, they went the four-year. They wanted that forward flavor profile to marry into the sweetness and the brown sugars of the Olorosa. Uh, which, which I'm like, okay, this, this, okay, I, I can see your point. So, you now that was a good afternoon of of two brothers and a father together uh, arguing over what should go into these barrels, and and as you can taste, it it it, it really ended up hitting what they should have hit. So it was a it was a good it was a good day. Uh, you might want to mention that you rejected our first load of Oloroso sherry too. Oh yeah, the barrels came here, and I'm I went out to the truck when they were unloading. I I, I said nope. And they're like, what do you mean no? I said, no, they're not They're not the quality I need. You guys going back down and pick some more barrels up. So, uh, yeah, because you know, we knew we knew what we wanted to do and how we wanted to do it. And so uh, so the first few barrels showed up, did not make the cut. Uh, it went back down. That's what Christian said. They went back down and went through a 60 lot uh, to end up with a four out of the 60 uh, that ended up in this particular lot of whiskey. And I, and I can't even come up with a number of how many barrels that we tasted to come up with a blend to fill those four barrels up with. That's awesome. So when you have the Olorosa barrels, do they get a one-time use from you guys? Yeah, so one time in first fill sherry for our bourbon finishing project. But we also make malt whiskey. We haven't released that yet. Um, our oldest ones are going on to six years right now. Um, we're going to wait one more year or another, at least one more season before we release anything that's malt. Um, so it's a malt whiskey is something that I think American palate, you'll see more and more coming around. Um, but American malt whiskey, I mean, coming soon, but like I said, for the actual finishing project, it's one time filled. Very cool. So we've hit a lot on the sherry bourbon or sherry finished bottled and bond here. What 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 is the wide range of spirits you have just so we can cover that? James, you want to get? So yeah, our spirit portfolio uh, goes all the way from uh, clear grain spirits of vodka, uh, all the way to uh, fruit spirits of brandy and uh, blueberry liqueur. So, uh, real quick, uh, if I was to rattle off, so we have what we consider our core four products, which is. What we send out for distribution, uh, which we have in Indiana and Kentucky predominantly, those are the states that we have statewide distribution in. And those core four products are our 31 Stars Vodka, Simon 1794 Gin, Carlty uh, Small Batch Bourbon, and our new Blackberry Whiskey that was first bottled in 2019, right? Um, so those are what we consider our core four. Those are the items that you should be able to find at any retailer throughout the states of Indiana and Kentucky. Uh, we do have some small distribution points to bars, restaurants, and retailers in other regional states as well. Uh, but what I focus on as a brand and sales manager is uh, Indiana and Kentucky specifically when it comes to distribution. Um, but beyond that, <clears throat> excuse me, we have you know this uh, Apple brandy, this bottled bond apple brandy that we sell on the estate. We have a peach brandy that's sold on the estate, uh, blueberry liqueur that will have some distribution, but predominantly sold here. Um, there are various bourbon projects that are sold here specifically. 
our old Rick House Rye is uh, back is going to be back out on the market here soon. Um, that just got its second batch release that was uh, sent to RNDC, Kentucky and Indiana. So that'll be back out in the market uh, here soon. Um, you have a Apple brandy, uh, the Applejack brandy. Um, you have our VS Great Brandy, a Starlight Reserve brandy. You have a 14 year pear brandy that Christian mentioned. So, I mean, we have a whole variety of things that are available at the estate specifically. Uh, but again, if you're throughout Indiana and Kentucky, uh, you should have access to those core four spirits that we try to get out through the States. Uh, and again, those are the vodka, our gin, uh, our Carl T bourbon and, uh, the blackberry whiskey. So real quick question here. Does the Applejack taste as good as what grandma taught you to make, uh, back in the eighties? We're, we're still we're still following those uh, still following those same recipes of our applejack goes into a new fifty three gallon bourbon barrel charred um, where our reserve brandies and all those go into a completely different barrel but those applejacks still go in that same style barrel yeah and kind of going off James and off Dad too I mean our bourbon itself is uh, we're not distributed very much um, you have to find certain groups and certain people to really find our products. Um, at Starlight, I mean, everything's a sense of terroir, the sense of our estate. Um, we've been here since 1843. Um, this is going to be our 177th harvest. Um, we don't have a normal barrel protocol when it comes to we produce this amount of barrels per year. It's all dependent on our harvest and what's coming off our facility. Um, there's certain years that Mother Nature plays nice and we get nice dry corn. We get the starch build up. We have nice sugar, turns into more barrels versus wet, damp years that really is a struggle for us so um everything's dependent off the estate when it comes down to it we pick and choose who we want to sell barrels to um and we're getting more and more choosy with that just because we want our whiskey to age um we never wanted to be bought whiskey um and you're going to hear that from a lot of people i think coming in the future that people want to show their individuality and their skills as a distiller not just a blender um and for instance we want to show you guys what southern indiana is um we didn't want to be Dickel. We don't want to be Buffalo. We didn't want to be a rebottled eight or 12 year NGP. Um, for us, I mean, each cask is an individual take of myself, my dad, my brother, Jason or Jesse. We all have very unique mash bills. I mean, cooking, um, we all cook differently. Um, we all, we have three different yeast, um, that we pick and choose and who has a better yeast strain. And we all cut this still differently. Um, everything, when it comes to our stills, are all hand done. When I cut a still, is different than when my father cuts a still or versus my brother. Um, it depends on the day. Um, so each individual cast is going to be so uniquely different. Um, in front of you, if you want to pull that, I think they're both T. Hubers, even though the bottle and bond should be a C. Huber. But um, when it comes down to it, um, each individual pick, that's, that's right. yeah. Chris's pick. Uh, yeah, but each individual pick, um, we sign our name who actually distilled it because dad's more forward, higher entry proof, um, those smoky, that big body, that traditional bourbon aspect. Uh, me, I go a little bit more higher in the rye aspect. So my mash bill A has higher rye, different yeast. I cook very differently, a long, prolonged cook. And how I distill, I cut pretty high. Um, so it has that more citrus rye pop um, when you try it out in the Rick House entry proof i there's rare occasions i go to 110 but i go all the way up to about 116 and max 118 that's my entry proof brother on the hand, other hand lower entry proof has a little bit more wheat into his um but we all like whiskey differently um for instance like our other brands a lot of people ask do you drink anything other than your brand oh hell yeah we do when we get out of here we want to compete on that level uh so we're drinking a little bit of everything uh, we put our brand on the level of New Rift, Wilderness Trail, and Peerless. Um, so when we're doing our blends or when we're picking single barrels, we taste their single barrels they're coming out with and their products because we want to compete on that level. Um, and that's kind of our standard. We want we want to show, even though we're a much smaller distillery as a whole, uh, we want to show our individuality. We want to show our farm. We want to show our estate. Uh, but we also want to show that we can play on that level. Um, and that's why we're picking and choosing on who we're selling our products to. If you see a Starlight on the shelf, A, there's probably not much of it behind it. 
But um, see, it's going to be unique and different. Um, so if you see it in Chicago on a biddings pick, or you see it in New York, or you see it D.C., or if it's in L.A., each individual cast is going to be something unique and different. Um, and look for who actually distilled it. And you can reach out to us. We are totally transparent. We'll tell you exactly our cook, our mash bills, the barrel choices. I mean, we have six different Coopers here, all toasted head all the way through. Uh, we use 12 year or 12 month air dried wood all the way up to 48 months. So it's like a when it comes down to it, having that transparency transparency gets people excited about your brand. I will tell you exactly which field your corn was grown in or your rye. Um, and we go all the way down to the nuts and bolts of what yeast we're using and why because no one's going to create whiskey like us. Um, they have a uh, they have a uniqueness with it, and that's what we love. So you just made reference to barrel char or mm-hmm. toasted toasted char. You want to tell us uh, a little bit about how you all select barrels, the style of char you use? Yeah, um, it comes down to it. Um, so it depend- that, That's a combination between uh, Christian, Blake, and I. Uh, typically, if you ever come through here, like today you guys walk through, you look back into the, the empty warehouse side, you'll see three different cooperage companies sitting back there. Uh, and you'll see different barrels within those cooperage companies. We literally do not decide what particular spirit goes into that barrel until it is done and ran. Um, we want we want to take the spirit of the day and put it into the barrel it wants to be in, not necessarily what we necessarily ordered for. So we we don't just order from one month from one cooperage company and so forth and so forth. So it literally is multiple cooperage companies in here, and then we pick the spirit that it goes into the barrel into that particular barrel. And I, and again, it's a it's a distiller's choice. When I'm running my week, I'm totally different at the end of it. Uh, when I'm tasting that spirit and when I'm, I'm like, all right, I want something that's more air-dried, has a little bit more seasoning. Um, I love toasted heads versus charred heads. Um, you guys and people that are listening, uh, the Michter's toasted head. Yes, um, yes, yes. I love that one. So going into toasted heads, especially with my rye, um, my particular rye mash bill, um, I'm using pretty heavy Saccharomyces cerevisiae to do my primary fermentation, extend it out a little bit longer, um, and then I do double pot distillation onto it, and I cut super, super high at the very end, um, keeping it very sweet but citrusy and keeping that toasted head for complexity in the milled palate. So. so kind of piggyback, you know, <clears throat> back in the old days, you know, people said that distillers were, were really just yeast propagators. You know, they were guys that kind of grew their own yeast and they kind of knew what they were doing, things like that. And you mentioned that you all three use a different type of yeast. It, and are those family recipe yeast or are those, you know, your everyday variety yeast that you can pick up or those type of things? Well, uh, let's start backwards from that. We're a sweet mash distillery. Uh, and so yeast is that important to us. So we're not doing sour mash. So every single distillery, whether it be uh, our dis- our distillate, I'm sorry, every single product that we produce is going to be sweet mash. Uh, and so yeast is important to us because we want to get to off to a really nice start. We want to get the fermentation going good. We're not doing sour mash. We're not doing back set, anything like that. So the yeast is uh, a flavor profile that is more important for a distillery like us than normal distillery. Uh, and so that flavor profile is going to be shown through the distillate better uh, and more prominent than other distilleries. Yeah, and when it comes to yeast strains, I mean, a lot of distillers don't want to, you know, it's a family, it's a family recipe or it's, a, it's been a heritage yeast strain they've had forever. Um, when it comes down to it, I mean, my brother's, I mean, he contacted her and being from Cornell University and being in the lab, uh, he found the Croatian beer yeast. And I mean, and I wish you were here a couple of weeks ago. We literally had about five to 15 five gallon buckets of different yeast trials going on, tasting the mash. And there's, I wish distilleries would do it larger than us. So you can actually taste the individual mashes because there's such an impactful uh, process going on there. I mean, it's just not fermenting your alcohol well you're bringing uh, in sweet mash you can bring over those citrus characters and those other characters with these different yeast um uh, and that's important uh if you're doing sour mash then you're just back setting and back setting but but a distillery like us they're doing sweet mash it is so much more important and and as the seasons change temperature change yeast have to change with it because they react different in different times of the year well and sugar availability within the mash bills are totally different i mean compared to yours and mine i mean yeast act differently within even that um 
So when it comes to rehydrating yeast and uh, kind of the overall flavor profile, I mean, certain di- certain yeasts like extended fermentations. Some like to be pitched at a hotter temperature. Some like pitching at a lower temperature. Um, so there's there's this science that goes behind it that's just not, oh, I just pitch my yeast and off I go for sweet mash. I mean, there's a true science that um, a lot of distillers, uh, we haven't talked about it a lot, but hey, either being a heritage brand or being that, you all have your individual ones they don't want to talk about. Uh, but for us, I mean, I wish people would come and like taste the 15 different trials of yeast that we're throwing out there, and we're constantly bringing more in. So when can we do that? Uh, <laughs> I was going to say, just come here during normal normal weekday. I mean, we're constantly, I mean, doing different trials. Uh, like I said, that Croatian yeast, I mean, we're, we're pulling these yeasts from these weird and wild regions, um, even though it could be a complete failure. I mean, but tasting them and seeing how they adapt um, and seeing, I mean, it's hard to see and magically appear seven years down the road of what this product's going to be. Um, but it's exciting when you do taste that mash uh, and you can tell there's a unique difference in that we want to try this. And then it's basically getting dad's uh, approval at that point, just be able to do a, a full week's run or do a full 20 barrels of it um, as an investment for us. But, I mean, we'll keep doing it just to find it and get our perfect one. Yeah, as somebody who used to brew quite a bit, you know, yeast was one of the things that was always a, a big thing. You know, yeast and hops were the two big things that, you know, I, I, I was really, really picky on what I used at those times. So I know that's got to be super important for somebody that's a micro distiller in, in those capacities. So I was kind of curious how that worked out for you. So why don't you tell us what you're cracking open there as you're popping well, the... We're just finishing a, a really cool whiskey that is available south of the river. Um it is a Kroger pick of all things. Uh, and James, you want to talk a little bit about it? Well, this, uh, I'm pretty sure this was done before I started, uh, I believe. But um, our great friend, uh, Chris Blanford at Kroger, um, is has heavily invested into the Huber Winery and Starlight Distillery program, uh, not only doing just bourbon barrel picks, but... Uh, doing a program uh, that we started, I believe, after this, which is called Follow the Barrel, uh, which basically he has picked a bourbon, and then from there, that barrel was used to age some blackberry wine for a bourbon barrel blackberry uh, private selection, essentially. Um, And then from there, that was used to, uh, that barrel was used to age um, some blackberry whiskey. And so th- this pick isn't a part of that, but because of this pick and because of the partnership between him, Kroger, Huber Winery, and Starlight Distillery, um, that Follow the Barrel program has evolved into uh, actually now a soon-to-be-released uh, Blackberry Whiskey private selection blend that he's done for Kroger. So uh, Chris has been a huge advocate of ours uh, ever since he started with Kroger. Um, and I, I've known Chris for a few years, uh, and as well as Ted and Christian and, and the other family members of the Huber family. Um, so I, like I said, I think this was done before I got here, but knowing Chris's palate, uh, I know it's going to be a great pick. I don't, I'm actually, I didn't try it. So I'm going to pour a little bit of it. Um, and then after that was, uh, what we just poured into your all's glass was a family reserve bourbon, which we are technically sold out of, but um, yeah. I'm going to let the let the guys talk about this a little bit. Well, I'll, I'll start with that because family reserve is, is a newer uh, product here at the distillery, and it is between uh, multiple generational tasters that I'll have to agree, and I think we talked a little earlier of how sometimes the younger and the older and the older – don't always agree on flavor profiles. Uh, but for something to be released to a family reserve means the all generations have to agree on it. And if I'm not mistaken, Christian, this is the only fourth one. This No, I, yeah, this is the fourth one. I the think fourth the, fourth, the fourth barrel. God, uh, has it been that quick already? I know. And so uh, literally we have to get those guys and ourselves all in the same warehouse at the same time. To pick a barrel that we all agree is absolutely fantastic that the different gener- three generations have to decide is a family pick. Yeah. 
Um, it, it's it's a process. Um, I'm going to no, talk about... Don't, don't talk about the process. Let's talk well, about the whiskey. Well, the process <laughs> is uh, like uh, like going to Thanksgiving and talking about the, the yams or the turkey. Who, what's the best? Yeah. Uh, whatever uh, mom made. Well, yes, it's exactly right. And I'm not dad. Usually it's whatever either. grandma made, let's be honest. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll go over a little bit about this particular release. It's 1328. But, um, I mean, it's... It's cast strength. All the family reserves are always cast strength. I mean, it was original. as they should be. Yeah, yeah. That's one thing we all agree on. By the way, it's is always. that we don't. If we're going to pick a barrel out, it's going to be a single barrel. It's going to be cast. We're not going to filter it. No, water it or anything like that. So our entire family is a huge cast strength, unfined, unfiltered, um, and that's just how we want our barrels to be drank. I mean, we have the option for people to do bottled and bond. Um, for instance, the bottle and bond cheer that we had at the beginning, um, a client bought half of that. And since why we proofed it down to bottle and bottle or bottled in bond, I since sold a sherry barrel that's going out to Los Angeles. So it's going to be at cast strength. Um, Ryan, um, he's going to be picking up our first cast strength one. Um, but we'll do that for people. The family we prefer cast strength, unfined, unfiltered. But number 1328, getting back onto it. I mean, it's very unique because of the Sugum and Row icon barrels that we used to it um going back to our coopers i mean we have six of them um and they're all very different some are charred heads some are toasted heads some are kennel dried some are air dried 12 like i said all the way up to four years um but some get really geeky um and this is a sugu monroe icon barrel um i did my senior thesis in barrels and so did my brother so when it comes down to it for actual like chemical makeup of barrel it doesn't get geekier than this. Uh, the Cooperage was originally founded in France. Um, they follow strict European laws when it comes to managing forest. Um, so whenever you're managing a forest, they pick older, richer staves. Um, so the older the staves are, the tighter those rings are going to go. So your actual oxidation to your actual whiskey is going to be a little bit differently. as and as well as how your spirit interacts with the uh, with the char that eventually um, but they actually oak scan this so we know that exactly the chemical makeup of each individual stave in this so the staves itself like i said they kick out portions of the wood out of here um, out of a single tree and they take the highest that are level in what we call like those guacol the sweeter the vanilla the toffee um, those aromas so they're keeping those um, and then coming back into it after that then they for a minimum of two years leave them in the yard rain on heat winter and so they heat up and they get rained on seasoning the barrels pretty much then they're hand built they're water bent they're a long toast flash char um, so the barrels itself are very, very unique. Um, so whenever it comes down to it, I mean, we love this barrel portfolio. Uh, they're certainly an investment, each one running typically around 1600 to $1,800 a barrel. Comparative to if you did Kelvin or ISC, that and dad was cool with that. Oh yeah, dad, dad, dad was uh, somewhat cool with those because we because we actually were in California picking the wood out on these. But this was a fun experiment right here. This literally was you can taste the whiskey. It that doesn't taste like any bourbon you've ever had in your life. Mm. Uh, these things are richer, more complex. The wood structure, the body, the, everything is just more intense with these. Yeah, and when it comes down to it, I mean, the barrel itself is complex. It's not a very simplistic whiskey. I mean, as it even oxidizes in your glass, it's going to develop. Um, how, how high of a proof was that? Uh, 112 points. No, it's 112. 112.4. There we go. It doesn't, it doesn't drink that, that high, that hot. It, it doesn't have the afterburn or even the mouth burn for that matter. Yeah. For any customers ever bought this whiskey from us, uh, that's in this family reserve have always came back and said, oh, MG, these things are fantastic. They're intense. They're complex. Even we, we've released the first ones at four year. Uh, they tasted far older than they were. Um, it, it is, it is a, a very unique experience. That <clears throat> yeah. I mean, it's something that is going to be it's going to be different every single year. And like I said, the family's going to agree on it, but it's going to be something that's complex and different. Um, but it's also going to have, like I said, we compete on the level, like I said, of New Rift Wilderness Trail. And, and when it comes down to it, and Peerless as well, I forgot to mention those. Um, we love those guys. We taste their whiskey constantly. But we want to release a product that's going to be at that level. But the Family Reserve, we want to compete on that level or above. We want people to really come back into it and be like, 
this is Indiana whiskey that's not NGP. And this is something that's going to be, it's going to be f- full and kind of bring you back. I mean, we want, when we release the family reserves and the family picks, we want people to be like, even to the the hardest Kentucky bourbon has to be made in Kentucky fans, we want people to be like, this is something that's going to be, I mean, rival some of the best. And that's right. what we want. I think James would come in here on this too is because when we do these family reserves, they are literally out there on their own. They are so unique. They're not normal. They're just those really cool whiskeys. When you're tasting them over there, all that caramel, all that vanilla, and all those tannins are not your normal bourbon. This is not your what you you know what you're normally tasting. These are beautiful, complex bourbons, uh, and we're, we're pulling these things off under six years. So am I going to be able to get a bottle to go to go along with the rye family reserve I picked up at the gift shop before I left? Well, I think that, James would tell you on, their, on, on this particular bourbon, you better know somebody to get this particular one. These things, yeah, these right. things flew off the shelf, uh, and uh, the critics just went, went wild with these particular things. Hey, James, my name is Josh, and now that I know somebody... <laughs> So uh, I feel like you know a few people now. After <laughs> drinking this, so a it doesn't drink like a normal, you know, four to six year old bourbon. This definitely drinks as, as a much older bourbon. Um, but as what I like to typically do is I like to drink one just a little below the neck and and and, and let it kind of get some oxidation and some air to it. I would love to revisit this bottle in a month and just see how much more the flavor profile changes during that that time frame because this is it, it does it's got a, a really really complex taste and. And it doesn't drink like you know your 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 typical, and it well, also drinks at it that that more like towards a hundred proof than the right. hundred and twelve that it's hitting. Right. It's a concentration. I think these barrels were these barrels were really the wood came in uh, to Napa Valley as a Napa Valley Cabernet wood. We hijacked that wood and put it over to a bourbon barrel for the concentration and the development of flavor profile within that. And so when you taste the whiskey, it's just that concentration that you don't normally get with a whiskey as young as it is. It shows its age uh, much more mature than it really is. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. No, yeah. Um, yeah, he's... Uh, well, and I was... Now, I was Christian, gonna... Christian was... How old were you when you were... We, we actually picked these barrels out in California when you were out there. How old were you? I don't know. I was right before... I was in you're high still, school. You're still in high school. I, yeah, I was still in high school for sure. I was... So a little backdrop i mean i ended up working in Napa valley uh, for a long time because i wanted to be in wine um but that allowed me to get the palette that i have and that's why i got so geeked out of wood is because the wine industry and i felt like the distilling industry we really didn't get into it that much um but when it came down to it i mean the wine industry the difference between european hungarian french the different toasts the different forests and all that makes up in the united states we just call it american oak uh, American Oak 53, well, most people, and I like 53-gallon charred American Oak better than any 15, 20-gallon out there. But when it comes down to it, we didn't get individual forest. We don't know the difference of our forest. And plus, the way we harvest wood is so quick and so young, we're not pulling a lot of that out. So when Sukum and Row, um, and there's another cooperage that's falling suit, and we're uh, hopefully going to get a trial underway with this other cooper, again, a French cooper coming to the American to make bourbon, high-end bourbon barrels. But Sagu Monroe was the first one that said, look, we're going to follow that protocol and we're going to get old aged wood and we're going to get wood um, that's going to show you guys exactly why it's worth $1,800. I mean, as it's in your glass, I mean, there's something very, I don't know, it's not that aha moment, but you see the difference between a typical charred American oak barrel versus something that has a little bit more effort oak scanning it and making making that just that extra step to really com- make it complex but the reason why i was smiling was i want you to try the rye version of the of that series so if everyone is done with the bourbon i'll pass the rye around is that the one that's in the gift shop right yes. now yes it is yeah. okay so that's the one i'm taking home with mm-hmm. me today right. and i'm gonna take home a bottle of that too right? so while we're passing that around i'm gonna ask you a quick question here so um you know, the, the rich family history of you guys doing farming and basically, you know, a lot of your product is farm to table, right? It's stuff you've harvested yourself. 
Um, James showed us a little bit more about the, the the bloody butcher and the and the combination of the blue corn and yellows and the whites and how all that's happened. How has that impacted your capability of not being able to do those shortcuts? Because I I feel like some of the distilleries are doing the fifteen gallon barrels and the twenty gallon barrels, so that way they can turn out a product in two years versus four, five, six, you know, and things like that. So how has how's that been able to help impact the fact that you guys are able to do things more in a traditional way? rather than, you know, make shortcuts in order to try to, to make a product? Well, I think that the the first and foremost thing is my partner, Greg Huber, and myself, and, and I go back to my dad and, and Uncle Carl, and then and then the next generation, next generation, I can keep going back. But, you know, we're, we're not a company that is short-term. We've been here for 175-plus years. Uh, we make decisions uh, that are generational, not weekly not monthly not yearly not decade uh it's generational um and uh i alluded a little bit earlier about the fact that uh uh not on, not on this podcast but with you guys know tour is that, that you know the distillery kind of came uh a little fast forward when we found out that christian and blake really liked this business uh that wasn't something that i just liked that the next generation really liked so the investment back into the company uh, really uh, was fast forward. The fact that we had a next gen wanting to take and take it on, um, and they both wanted to go to college and and learn it and do it. So Christian, you want to respond a little bit on that because literally yeah. that that is when you have a generational company that's 175 plus years. You don't want to invest into a particular uh, segment of the company if you don't have a, a group of family members that want to take that particular one on. But what we saw with the, the both the winery and the distillery is that this next group really want to take it on. Mm. And I mean, exactly right. When it comes down to it, I mean, I love this industry if I'm out of it. Um, I'm in a bunch of different barrel groups. I just love whiskey naturally. I mean, last week I just bought an... Uh, I was lucky enough to find a little Easter egg on on a Kroger shelf. I bought the 2019 Four Roses release. Uh, Open that up. Um, I have all the E.H. Taylors. I even have the 18-year um, marriage coming my way. I mean, I've collected the antique series, and I love whiskey. I really do, and I love scotch as well. So having that huge back bar to taste and um, being able to refine my palate has brought me into this. But the one thing that I wanted to bring forward was that a sense of place and a sense of terroir um, into the bourbon market um, too many people I think in the United States thinks bourbon bourbon um, but there's so many unique different expressions you can have from California to Texas to New York and from the original region right here in Louisville Kentucky or southern Indiana or into Tennessee um, having that like scotch mentality of saying like look we're all unique. We're producing the same concept, but let's have individuality. I know Tennessee whiskey kind of lumped off their own, but bourbon's becoming to get that way. I mean, as the ones that collect um, Smoke Wagon or collect Balcones or is now doing anything from the Finger Lakes Distilling up to Traverse City, as all of us are starting to get a little bit more seated in the marketplace and you start tasting, I mean, when it comes down to it, where our Rick House is set, the growing degree days um, for our Rick Houses, so those heating, the diurnal shift, all that's impacting into whiskey. Um, but coming from a family that's always allowed me to be able to express what I like to drink and express what's going on, I mean, I love it. I mean, I'm here on a farm that's 177 years old. I mean, I'm harvesting corn and rye that's going into the products that I'll try seven, eight years down the road. Um, and then that's a bigger sense of place or a bigger sense of self than anything. I mean, a lot of the whiskey, I mean, every year I set down four barrels that are going to 20 plus years old. Um, and those are going to be what my kids are going to be selling. So that's something that, I mean, we really, really want to have. And um, I know I, my brother not being here, he's in Cornell in upstate New York, and uh, hopefully he's in his last final as we speak. So hopefully he'll graduate, come back here and do the same thing. But when it comes down to it, I mean, we love this industry. I mean, I've had great mentors over the years from my dad all the way to, I mean, Dave Pickerel um, when he was coming here for the ADI days. I mean, I've, I was a little kid in the background during the ADI conference, sitting in the back room way before I was actually legally supposed to, being able to smell and taste these products. I mean, it's 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 a, it's a fun industry to be in. It's going to be even 
more fun in the future as we start to see these next what i call next heritage brands come up and how that plays with the whiskey market that aren't the big suntories brown foreman and diageo um switching into it though i mean we have in front of you the rye uh, family reserve and actually it was funny enough so it's one of me and blake's um, sweet sarvisa uh, yeast strains long cook a uh, high cut um, rise. So, that, so what's the mash bill on this? Sorry to interrupt you, but uh, it should be it, it should be between eighty twenty or ninety ten. Back then, we don't know. Uh, <laughs> literally, back then, we don't know. Because, sleep at the wheel, man. Yeah, I'll tell you well, well, you know, I was back there just I had a canoe paddle in my hand, stirring stuff, and <clears throat> all the fun stuff that you do as a craft distiller back then. And uh, beautiful whiskey, though. Uh, doesn't have any of the MGP kind of minty or any of those kind of characters. It's very classic, uh, more European rye. Uh, just beautiful expression. Uh, it has a burnt orange peel to it. I was going to say, yeah, I almost get like a, 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 a higher citrus, yeah. especially on the aroma. One, 114, but but it doesn't come across to over higher than 100. I All just dropped a little bit of water in it, and I tell you what, it opens that sucker yeah. up. And it is amazing. It is something that with this, what we call, me and Blake call the citrus barrels, like what we've been mentioning. It's like this particular one is like if you took a creme brulee and you burnt it, that fresh caramelized sugar on the front, but with that nice like citrus pop in the back. And it's not a, it's really weird because it's heavy up front, but in the back you start getting these flickers of that rye spice that kind of jump off the palate that I really like. And it's, it's very, really, yeah. Very good. Mm. I'm glad I picked that up, and I'm I'm very good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a it's a nice ride. Now, people don't understand that 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 when we built the distillery, we built it as a high ride bourbon distillery, and so everything was built for sweet mash, and everything was built for having high rye bourbon or rye. And so when you come in here, you won't see these tanks that you put your fingers down to, and everything's closed up high. Uh, fermenters and everything else. A little different distillery than people normally see when they go to Kentucky uh, because we're running sweet mash and running high rye on every day. Uh, But when we run rye, you get these flavor profiles. And sometimes we look at people and say, well, where's the mint and where's some of these other classic rye characters? And we're like, you know, we're, we're, that's not what we're doing on a day-to-day basis here at Starlight. Yeah, it doesn't have that that minty flavor. Um, you get almost more like a a cracked pepper, um, and it's got some of those um, nice notes there. Um, also, I, it's weird. It almost has like a brown sugar caramel flavor on the backside. It's it's got a really odd note that I don't typically get on a rye, and I don't know if it's because it's a high malt, you know, you you think it's probably in that 20% range or, you know, 10 to 20%. Yeah, I, I think a lot of it has to do with that, but a lot of it has to do with the fact that the fermenters uh, in the stills, uh, there's not column again, we're pot still here at Starlight. Uh, I think some of those things take some of those more hard, harsh, more burnt things out of it, and we get more of the sweet side of it. Uh, not for sure why the mint. I, I, I still can't understand why we're not uh, – some some of the mint characters that other people get with that we don't get here because it's only about 10% of the barrels that we get, get those minty characters. So you mentioned the stills, and, and I know you guys have two. You have one two, one that you basically do you, a lot of your brandy and your gins and things like that often, and then you have your bourbon still. Yeah. Um, did you – it's just lore. I mean, you had to have named them. What's the names? No, so the Carl still, as we, I mean, Christian Carl's Carl still. So the Christian Carl's are out of Germany that dad bought um, back in 2001. And it's set up to be a traditional cognac or Armagnac still. So what it has is a 80 gallon copper pot. Direct above it is a low wine column to a condenser. Um, and it cleans up spirit so softly and so sweet. Um, it adds its elegance to it. Um, like I said, with brandy production, you want to strip off a lot more oils names than you. So. Huh? Names. Oh. Well, it's just. You didn't name our stills yet. Well, no, it's just Vendome and Carl. I mean, <laughs> literally. It literally is. I mean, the manufacturers are the names of our stills. Yeah, yeah and Vendo, I mean, Vendo Brass and Copper do a, a beautiful job. Um, I mean, with our still, I mean, you guys custom did it. I mean, when it came down to it, I mean, it's set up to do, I mean, high rye. So you basically have this. 
I mean, 500 gallon pot with a huge onion with a long gooseneck that makes it my job really easy as a distiller of high rye for the foaming aspect of it. Keep that down. Coming across, I can run a low wine column and I can run through the condenser both times so I can strip off a lot more of those oils and getting those higher citrus notes in rye and in my bourbon. I'll hear a little bit later. I don't know if I have one up here. We might do it after the podcast, but I'll let you try one of my um, super cleaned up bourbons that have a lot more of that toffee, that caramel, and that rye citrus into it. So, Christian, uh, what they're asking is, uh, can we name our stills? No, I don't. I'm just they're Vendome, they're Vendome and Carl. You had to wait till you got a, a granddaughter. I, I don't or know. A, yeah, a daughter. Literally, I mean, literally, the, the answer to the question so far is no. They don't have names. Well, you've got to figure that out. Everybody uh, says every great distiller has to name their 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 pot stills, and typically they name them after women because they have curves, right? Mm, oh yeah, there are there are. We have curvy stills. I can tell you that. <laughs> Uh, Christian, you don't have a couple of ex-girlfriends we can name one of them after? Oh, no. Well, <laughs> yeah. What when it, say? Crazy Holy. ex-girlfriends? Because usually, you I, know, those Vendomes are very uh, temperamental being pot stills. They're, so they're, when I buy a still, I mean, either, I mean, when I'm, I hope the Vendome guys are listening. So whenever we come down and pick out another still, I mean, then I'll name it because it would be my still compared to his. I mean, it's those are your still, so you get to name those. Well, so. he don't, he don't want to name his, his still after his mom. <laughs> well, I think that's not a very good thing to do. No, you don't Curve. want to name it after your, after you your mom. No, you don't want to name it after your mom. So. <laughs> For one, it might be temperamental, like I that's said. That's right. <laughs> well, so I got a couple of just really off-topic, random questions for you guys, if that's okay. Yeah, we got to go right ahead. All right, so we haven't talked about wine very much at all, and I don't want to focus too much on it, but Pops Reserve, do you all use any of your bourbon barrels to to finish the Pops Reserve? Uh, that's a great question because our very sought after, which is less than two or three thousand bottles a year, uh, double barrel is uh, our our own barrels. I got a couple at home oh, that, no. that I haven't the, opened and I love them. Well, they, they you can sell them online for good money right now. So. Are you serious? There's, <laughs> oh, a, so, there's, there's a secondary on oh, double. Oh, on pops double. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there, there was a guy that was selling a case of pops for almost a hundred dollars a bottle. Yeah. So, That's awesome. so the double barrel, the double barrel is our barrels going back into it the second time. So that double whiskey, double flavor, Carl T going into it. Beautiful, beautiful expression, but. Yeah, that's available first part of uh, uh, actually mid November. I tell you what, and those pops doubles really sneak up on you in the end too. Oh, the mm-hmm. whiskey's jumping up, jumping up on it. But yeah, they that, are awesome. They got and by the way, uh, just reach out. That was Christian's project. Yeah. So I'm 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 taking all the credit right here. But that was really <laughs> Christian's. That was really Christian's project. Uh, when, his first year back at the company. Said, hey, we got these beautiful barrels. We just dumped a bunch of Carl T and said, "Why don't we go ahead and put, you know, a little pops back into it the second time and get a little more whiskey?" And then we put it on the market, and the first people bought that was fourteen ninety nine, mm-hmm. pretty cheap back then. Now, now they're twenty ninety nine, but, mm-hmm. but uh, still a beautiful, beautiful bottle of wine. So let me ask another random question here: Your all's favorite, maybe not favorite, but your most sold style cocktail up here uh, at at the Orchard and Winery. That's either you got to be the blackberry sangria or a blackberry whiskey lemonade. Uh, sorry, uh, blackberry sangria or blackberry whiskey lemonade. Well, uh, probably one or the other. It has to be. Well, at, when it comes to blackberry, like as a general, our blackberry whiskey is probably one of the – we haven't really talked about it today. I mean, we, we skip over it as distillers because anything flavored, yes, you know what I mean. It's that screwball, the crown royal peach, everything gets lumped into it. Um but our blackberry whiskey in general, um, it's two to three year old bourbon that we didn't deem to go into our bourbon portfolio because we're not going to release anything that's subpar for us. That's not going to happen. And like I mentioned, we do a lot of experiments. And some, I mean, I hate to say it, but we, when it comes to our barrels, yeah, there are babies, but we don't have a trouble saying they're ugly babies sometimes. Well, I think you all should talk about how the blackberry whiskey even came about well yeah well look outside that window i know no one's here and do you see those blackberries right on the top of that hill uh, i can't see anything but i'm sure they might be able to yeah <laughs> we believe you go yeah. ahead yeah the blackberries are right outside there so when it came down to it everything's a sense of place so when we come to that sub like that bourbon blend i mean it came down to it where we wanted 
have a flavored whiskey that wasn't in sense flavored unnaturally if you know what i mean right. so when it came down to it i mean we have fresh blackberries growing wild all over this farm and then propagated for our u-pick um so we crushed that blackberry down um and what was going into blackberry wine the one day we decided to pump the blackberry and do a flavored a real flavored into it so uh it was like i said it was a bourbon mash that's just put with flesh fresh blackberry juice to sweeten it up so you don't have any artificial sweetening to it it's fun because we get to have a manipulation with mother earth um, there's a process called chiro extraction to where you can freeze the juice getting the sugar levels higher onto it um, so we take that up and we're concentrating those flavors that's coming out into what what is our blackberry whiskey um and like i said we can't you can't put blackberry flavored bourbon i mean that's not a category so whenever you have it i mean it's it's blackberry whiskey as a category and we wish we could say um that it's made by that but ttb has some very price structured where you have to uh, put the word flavor to it but it's a hell of a product and hell of a cocktail back to it and like he was saying the blackberry flavored whiskey lemonade is a huge 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 um seller for us in the blackberry or um, blackberry sangria with the blackberry wine and brandy i mean both those two are phenomenal i hear the ladies love it yeah yeah it's a it's a real i i, I don't know if i would say on i don't know how big the audience is but i mean we have a nickname for that um for that product here on the property and it is a uh it will sneak up on you more than you think i mean it is 84 proof but drinks like a liqueur that's i mean low i mean you can down i mean a quarter of that bottle without realizing it and then uh oh and then you're uh then you're really in trouble yeah my my wife actually that's one of the few whiskeys she'll actually drink is that blackberry whiskey but you know she loves the blackberry wine as well um but but we do do the the lemonade cocktail with it we get some pink lemonade mix it up with that and and a matter of fact my uh my 16 year old got a got a little nip of it not too long ago when we we <laughs> made a little small batch of it for the wife and she's like wow this is really good and i'm like i bet you think that is really good yeah. <laughs> and that's why scott doesn't have a bottle at his house now that's right yeah. so you you just gave us one more bottle to pass around here and it's the single barrel estate apple brandy you want to tell us a little bit about that uh, almost sold out uh this particular product is getting close to being sold out uh it's a true bottled and bond apple brandy coming out of the apple jack uh process uh, this was a very unique barrel. We were doing a dump for our normal Applejack uh, process. Uh, and this barrel was coming out of 20-something barrels. It was just so beautiful and so aromatic and so flavorful. We couldn't blend it in. And then we, we kicked it out, and we let it sit in the distillery for almost a month wasn't it christian you yeah were, you were yeah. here yeah it was almost a month or so it was almost a month and uh, we're like we got to do something different with this barrel and then we decided to go ahead and do a bottled and bond uh with the uh, well and just speaking by half of it i mean as a brandy drinker it's a very understated i mean around this region at all i mean live it on the west coast i mean brandy is a hotter market out in uh in napa where i was and then my brother being in new york it's hotter within the two coasts um but as a brandy, this is a bridge, this product in particular, because it's aged in brand new charred uh, Zach Cooperage barrel, so char number three. So it has that very, it has a bridge in between the sweeter, lighter, more style of an apple brandy, but still have that little bit more of that smoky and that more of that denseness that you would find in a bourbon without being light and overly, with overly uh, sweetness onto a, what a typical brandy would be. Um, and like I said, I mean, we didn't want to throw this barrel away because it did bridge that gap. And we were tasting, I mean, this barrel with a ton of different people saying, should we do it? Should we not do it? Should we keep brandy brandy or should we not? Um, but uh, like I said, we've now sold two of these barrels. I mean, one to our really great friend, Prov out of DC, great barrel selection guy. If you ever look into him, Prov has extraordinary barrel picks i mean through everybody i mean when it comes to buffalo trace all the way through but um his apple brandy he picked up one of these at bottled and bond um the other half the sister barrel to this i mean and it really shocked a lot of people over this country saying this is what american brandy is um and i mean you guys can speak on to the tasting notes of it right now if you'd like but i mean it's something that is unique to this marketplace that i don't think really anybody is really coming about and doing so I'm not a big brandy fan, but I will tell you this um, 
hits different. I mean, it really does. Um, it's got a, a lot of different, I mean, it's really complex, honestly. It's got it's got a couple of different flavors that I'm not really used to. But like I said, I don't drink a ton of brandy. And when I typically do drink brandy, I, I prefer like a pear brandy or um, some other fruit characteristic, you know, outside of the actual traditional um, apple product. Yeah, I mean, a lot of these higher lact, like these higher ketone, these like light, butterscotch the caramel is a sweeter toffee notes that's like instead of being dense i mean it's like melted like a little bit more in the brainy sense and in the palate it's a lot lighter than your traditional whiskeys i mean when you put it in your mouth i mean it has that light i mean coats it without being totally heavy i mean brandies aren't typically yeah they can be drank neat um but it's a it's an after dinner meal i mean as it goes around your palate um I mean, totally typical to drink it out of a Glencairn, but out of a brandy sniffer, a little bit warm allows those um, those esters to basically evaporate into your bowl or your glass, and you get a little bit more of an experience that way as well. Uh, for those people who are looking to explore outside of bourbon and rye, um, American brandy has that uniqueness to it as well um, that not a lot of people are doing. And there, you can find some. And we we have old as eighteen year old brandy here. Um, we have all the way, like I said, back to vintage 2002. I mean, today we just bottled vintage 2009 and, uh, and a 2013 in a little small batch. We did 1,200 bottles of it as a limited run. Um, but, I mean, American brandy for us has always been a slow, steady seller for us. And it's picking up in this region around Louisville, Kentucky, because uh, people are preferring it over something that has a little bit more husk, a little bit more grain, a little bit more spice, and they're saying, you know what, after dinner I want something a little more softer, more complex, a little sweet pop to it. Almost like a dessert wine, right? Exactly. <clears throat> James, so, what do you think? Yeah, um, no, I mean, the apple brandy, uh, the bottle and bond, I mean, so you look at the, the various apple brands we have. You have the regular apple jack, you have the uh, more French-style, traditional, apple brandy uh reserve apple brandy and then you have this bottled and bond apple brandy that's i mean it follows all of the bonding rules essentially um but when i before i started here um so i worked in liquor retail uh for a few years and then i was a bartender um in louisville for uh a few years as well um but there's just really you know nothing like this spirit on the market <clears throat> excuse me um it, you know, when I was coming up here for liquor retail and, uh, I did a couple bar barrel picks with the retailer that I was at, um, and Christian, you know, tasted me on the whole profile. Like this is one of the ones that stood out, not because of the flavor, but I mean, the, the label's beautiful. The bottle's beautiful. I think it's fantastic. Prov did, uh, like Christian said, a, a barrel pick of this that, uh, we have seen some really fantastic feedback on, on social media, um, through Facebook, Instagram, just folks, just very pleasantly surprised about how good apple brandy can be. Um, especially for those folks that are more bourbon palate, uh, you know, uh, forward. So I personally really love this. Um, I will say before we leave, we should try the uh, pear brandy. Personally, that's probably my favorite one. Uh, it's 14 years old. Um, it's absolutely fantastic. So we have that uh, that we can we can try out real quick before we're all done here for the evening. Um, but I mean, it's a limited release product. It's available here. Prov had his pick. Um, I will say there is one location in Southern Indiana that is going to feature this in their uh, in their restaurant, and that is going to be Borden and You, um, okay. and they are going to have this available uh, either as a I believe a neat pour or in a cocktail. Um, so they are working with that specifically, and that is the only location uh, outside of us that will will have this. They're not open just yet, are they? they for, are as a restaurant, <laughs> they are still yeah, they're still working on it, but um, I think. I yeah, Christian can talk more about it. And I'll hype him up a little bit. Zach has been a great friend of mine all the way through high school. Um, I'm helping him work on the wine list especially. Um, but he's going to have a really cool, interesting spirit list and wine list um, that kind of gets you out of the norm of what your traditional drinking area around here. Um, so we're highlighting a lot more uh, interesting whiskeys and wines from around the world, trying to bring it back home. And then also highlighting a lot of the uh, – 
individuality of the cheeses and the charcuterie and how that all plays together into what spirits are because spirits by themselves are an interesting category but as a combined um when it comes to spirits and wine and food it's a whole different ball game of how different i mean different things pair and how things go together we yeah. did for uh, right right before mother's day we made it out and did a, a curbside pickup at borden you uh, uh, nice for my wife and it was a graze box mm-hmm. and very good just yeah. very cool that they do that and that they were pushing that during all the corona stuff is uh, curbside and come check it out and pretty cool once they open up and what they're going to offer yeah so i got a couple of uh i guess questions to kind of finish this thing up for you guys um one um james was cool enough to show us that we, we've got a uh, a special bottle, a cup, a few special barrels of bourbon that are kind of sitting in the bottom of the wine um, rick house that are, that, that are down in the cellar that, that are going to be coming out in the next couple of years here. Um, a you, next you tell couple, us a, I thought he said it was like twenty some years, twenty five. Uh, next couple of decades. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. My bad. I, I misunderstood him. No, so, no, no, no yeah. worries. So yeah, so that's going to come out in the next couple of decades. Um, tell us a little <laughs> bit more about that, and then and how how do we get to try that here in, in a few years? So <laughs> it's then, a fun story. I mean, we're set up to be a distillery that's not. I mean, we don't want to put out young juice our entire life. I mean, four to six year old blend. We're doing really extraordinary barrels at that range, um, but our mash bills meant to go higher i mean we want to be able to compete like i said with everyone's typical seven and nine year blends um and going above that for single barrels um so when we barrel and the why we're so picky of who we sell to is because we're getting to the age um and every year we sit more and more barrels back going 10 years plus i mean 20 years plus um but having the knowledge from whiskey around the world we're how we're aging these whiskeys, I mean, yes, in the traditional rick houses, we have three on the property, um, but also when they're getting up to that 10, 11, 12 years, pulling the reins back a little bit, uh, so the extraction on it is a little bit slower. There's a very famous 23 and 20-year-old 20 out there right now that has a lot of wood and a lot of oak, um, and people love that. Um, it's not my cup of tea. I want to try to be able to rein that back in a little bit, holding holding that oak without overly extracting it at that age group. I think Scotland, A, with their climate, and B, the way they rotate barrels and how they're aging those, they're phenomenally smart. I mean, um, when it comes to whiskey, Maker's Mark kind of figured it out with their caves against their back end, and I think you're finding more distilleries starting to figure out, hey, if we go uh, go into a little bit more of a cool climate, I mean, this or a cool warehouse, I mean, wow. we can extend these ages out a little bit longer, and that's what we're doing. I mean... We're, we're wine we're 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 geeky whiskey and we're geeky guys so when it comes to compounds and overly extraction and how things work i mean there's no doubt that me and my brother i mean at cornell university using the gc machine and seeing the exact shit what, what about your dad dude uh, <laughs> he's here i mean he yeah, paid he, he, yeah, he pays for it yeah he pays for it the i mean he pops out man <laughs> Yeah, well, when it comes down to it, though, I mean... He said it next to me, by the way. He said directly next yeah. to me. Well, <laughs> when it, but I will say, me and my brother was, I mean, we want to see the chemical makeup of these big products, too. I mean, we're, we can never recreate it because each individual distillery and their mash and everything is individual. But we want to see why and what is over extraction the compounds are getting, at what level they're getting extracted, which mash bills they are. And that's helping us gauge to be a bigger brand in the future. I mean, we want to be smart about what we're doing, and we don't want to be bought. So we got to be very careful of what we're doing. And like I said, that comes down, unfortunately, we're a very allocated product. Um, when you see us out in the marketplace, like I said, I mean, pick one up because there's not much out there, and we there's never going to be. We're never going to be a big national brand. I'm, I don't – Dad can speak on to it. You never wanted to be – me and Blake don't want to be. Maybe my kids, if they choose to. But we're going to put back good whiskey – and we're going to age it. I mean, it's a sense of our farm. I mean, our farm's only so big. Uh, we can buy property and plant more corn, but at this point, I mean, Mother Nature gives what we get, and we're happy about it. We baby those barrels up. We do experiments. Um, and that's what I want people to know about our brand is that we're doing it to be able to put barrels back for that age. And we're thinking about that because, I mean, my kids are going to have this one day, and there's kids, kid, my grandkids will have it. So setting them up on a tee is what we want to do. Well, I, I think you guys are – you're doing something right because we haven't tasted anything tonight that wasn't just very good. And, and this pear brandy, yeah, 
I, the apple brandy was okay, but this pear brandy is really smooth. Yeah. Yes. Top, that, five, top five product across the whole wine and spirits before Leo. Right there, pear brandy. Makes sense because it's just good. It's got a really nice fruity flavor to it. Yeah. yeah it's super fruity. Um, it's super, super smooth. I mean, yeah. This shit would get you in trouble. Pardon my French, but I mean this will <laughs> this yeah, will get you in trouble real sure. quick. It's not the um, panty. But I've been a, but I've been a huge pear brandy for for fan for you know quite a few years. Like I said, um, and I, I tell you what, this rivals some of the stuff I had in Europe. I mean, oh. I, I will not lie. I mean, this absolutely tra- rivals you know some of the products I had while I was over in Switzerland and in Germany over the past couple of years. So just so, um, congratulations on that. Just going off of that, um, in the, in the recent years, um, specifically in, uh, for the LA spirits competition, uh, these guys are the only ones to win, uh, some gold. And, uh, actually I'm pretty sure it was all gold, silver medals. Uh, I'm pretty sure we're the only American only. distillery yeah, to win only. against the, uh, the French distilleries when it comes to brandy at the LA spirits competition in the past years. So uh yeah I mean you're you're right on right on board with with what they're producing and and what were they're being awarded so so if we're wrapping this up here what is one last parting comment that you want the bourbon community to know about Huber's uh the you know the bourbon clubs the bourbon hounds mm. uh <laughs> the local groups and, and we're all a part of those and love yeah. that community well, uh, I'll start as the elder. Uh, mm-hmm. and, uh, just, Christian's Small just eating this up. Every time Dad uh, tops in, man, Christian just kind of gets yeah. quiet and it gets, rustles it, over to the yeah, side. It gets very tough because it's a, it's a family. I know, but James is sitting over here to the left and Christian's to my right. And I'm sitting here thinking, you know what? The one thing we want to do is make the best product. We never want to follow Kentucky. We didn't follow anything else. We want to do our own thing. So we're sweet mash, we're doing pot stills and all this other stuff. So we started that, and then and then 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 you know James and Christian sitting to my right and left here, come on board and they're like, okay, this is wait, we, you know, we're doing what we need to do. We want to do what we need to do, uh, and the overall quality is starting to show right now. So the next generation is taking over right now. So I'm going to turn over to Christian. Yeah, I mean. When it came down to it, I mean, what the local bourbon groups need to know about us, and as we get going, I mean, we want to highlight our terroir. I mean, we're very different in the bourbon market, and we want to be. I mean, we're the black sheep on the other side of this river. I mean, and it is a, we want to make that bold statement, and there's nothing more empowering than being that black sheep and make a good product. But we have to make good product because our competition, like I said, is Peerless, New Rift, and Wilderness Trail. I mean, they're right across the river, all producing phenomenal things. They're bigger than us. But we want to show people what our estate can do. From our non-GMO corns to our indigenous rye that grew here in the Ohio River Valley to our Canadian rye seed that we grow um, to our sweet mash um, to our individual yeast strains to the way we distill. I mean, we invite people. I mean, there's countless people that come up here that like my dad's barrels or they like my brother's barrels or they like mine. Um, and it's that little light that, like, kind of switched them because, like I said, this isn't rebottled Dickel, Buffalo, or NGP. I mean, when you start tasting craft whiskey at this level, I mean, I mean, everyone kind of smiles. And, I mean, we get these interna- or national people right now with Prov, uh, with the uh, Elite Barrel Group out of uh, Rochester, with Ryan's group coming out of L.A., um, some insurance from Whiskey and Consensus, um, shooting it down to uh, James down in Florida with uh, Bourbon Enthusiast. And, I mean, we're getting barrel Christian, picks. To, uh, Christian, remember that we're the other MGP. Uh, you know, a lot of people think of Indiana whiskey as MGP. And, and, and currently the headlines for us is not MGP. And that's, that's what's setting us apart. Uh, is the fact that we're growing it, we're milling it, we're distilling it, uh, putting the barrels, aging it, and bottling it right here on the farm. Yeah, and when it came down to it, I mean, I mean, I, I wish my brother was here because he'd say the same thing as us, is that we, we're excited as the next generation to prove to you why we're supposed to be on that market. Doesn't sound like Dad's ready to go yet. So, no, no, so. Oh, no, Dad's, no, Dad's only... <laughs> but, uh, Dad's not that old. Dad's only... Yeah, Dad's only been in the mid-50s right now, so... Yeah. But, but it, it sounds like 
the future's super bright here. I mean, you know, just just from the time that I've got to spend with Christian here, and and I really do wish Blake was here because I I think that you know that would give us a little bit more insight to to what the future holds for for Starlight and and the Huber family just in general. I mean, as far as what things are going and. And and it's just super super good what we're seeing right now. And then to know that these guys have been involved with you, Ted, and, and and working hard and and running the stills and and the fact that they've you, you, you know it could have been easy as a as a family business to say, oh guys, come on in and do this. But you made them do the work. You made them go to college. You made them go learn different things. You made them you know learn from the from the ground up what what it takes to run this type of business and. And, and that's super important when you look at these type of things. And, and I think that, that that tells tales of how this family business has been able to grow from out the years, throughout the years, from wine to the, the farm to what you all are now making, which is a great distilled product. Right. I think James is sitting here to my left, and he's kind of making some notions that says, you know, the difference between us and a lot of people is that the boys have to work. Uh, they come in, and they don't just come in and just – to no. tell people what to do they actually do the work uh and that's different than a lot of distilleries so james yeah um i mean th- it, these guys are seven days a week producing 24 <laughs> 7 um as the, as the brand and sales manager um a lot of my work does focus on distribution and how i can uh you know effectively sell product to restaurants bars and retailers throughout indiana and kentucky um but when I have some downtime, I'm down helping uh, bottle bourbon. Like uh, I was telling you all today, you know, we were going through some Carl T, helping bottle some hand sanitizer. But the Ted, the boys, the the family is completely involved. Um, you know, it's it is there's no bureaucracy, there's no red tape. It is purely a hundred percent family ran um and and that's what i love telling folks and you know folks that don't um understand or are unfamiliar with the brand especially with starlight distillery because folks know um huber winery they know sweet marcella they know blackberry wine they know the bourbon barrel blackberry wine and the starlight wine series um but but getting to really dive into the starlight distillery um that that's what really makes me happy as their brand and sales manager, um, and and getting to to fully detail uh, what the family does in the distillery. So it's it's a great time. Well, well uh, James, thank you for that, uh, James, because you know Christian and Blake actually uh, have to work. They don't they don't come in the office. They have no <laughs> office. They, they share. Don't, yeah. They share my office. Yes. Uh, and they actually have to run stills, make cuts, fill barrels, pump barrels, bottle. take the you know, bottle and the whole thing. Drive so, the uh, forklifts. Uh, Christian packs up uh, R&D sees deliveries. Uh, yep. He, I mean, the boys are doing it all. Well, yeah. So w- when it comes down to actually making cuts and telling that they're making whiskey, they they don't like put something on the piece of paper and hand it to somebody mm-hmm. to make whiskey. They well, actually make whiskey uh, from from grain all the way into what goes in the barrel today well, is, Christian, you're, you're, where you going? well today is friday may 22nd the last day i took off was new year's day mm-hmm. and i still was here on new year's day i just chose not to run the still mm-hmm. the last day before that was christmas day and the day before that was sometime in july you have a cot no, and it's it. it, it I live yeah, on the I, house just yeah. over there. <laughs> I live on the property. I mean, well, Christian, just tell everybody it's more fun making whiskey oh, yeah. and sitting on the beach or having fun here. I mean, Shh. literally, we we make we make whiskey, and it it is fun, guys. No, absolutely, beach. it has to be. It is, and 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 I'm laughing. We're all smiling around this table right now. I mean, Christian's like saying that he's suffering. But it's fun coming in. Well, it's, well, it, it literally is fun coming with whiskey. Well, yeah. On the weekend and I mean, whiskey. yeah, it gets a little tedious when it comes to like cleaning out the mash tanks. And, All like, right, I'm, I'm taking your salary down. Yeah, like, that's sounds right. like a motion to adjourn. <laughs> no, yeah. I, <laughs> we we love this. I mean, day after day. I mean, I want to be here. I I want to be able to do this. And like I said, it's now so rewarding to see where my whiskey has been at six years old. I can't wait for another six and another six to see how it develops. I mean, I want to do this. I, every day I wake up in the morning wishing that there was more hours in the day so I can make more whiskey. But I don't want to buy a bigger pot because, I mean, it's a sense of place. 
I mean, we want to show that terroir, the individuality, and I want to show you that what myself, my brother, my dad, what goes behind Starlight to make Starlight. And that is our property, our stills, our passion, our history. I mean, just come up with talk with us. I mean, I encourage everyone, if you're if you're thinking about coming up, reach out to James, reach out to myself, and we will show you what makes Starlight different and what makes Starlight, I mean, why I hope to God it's going to be a heritage brand coming into it. Not a big heritage brand, but something that's going to be around here for a long time. Thank you so much for having us up here tonight, you guys. I, Absolutely. I had a blast. No, thank you. So, for hey, if people now. want to reach you guys, James, I'm gonna let you take this one. How can they reach, um, you know, Ted, Christian, yourself here at uh, Starlight Distillery and Huber's Winery? Yeah. So we have a Facebook and uh, Instagram account for both Huber Winery and Starlight Distillery. Uh, Facebook is going to be just Huber Winery and Starlight Distillery. Instagram is going to be Huber Winery, and the uh, Instagram Starlight Distillery is going to be Starlight underscore Distillery. Um, you are more than welcome to contact us through those uh, through those accounts. You can also visit our website, huberwinery.com. We have a contact us link for any and all questions uh, for that as well. Um, and we are more than happy to answer any question you send our way. And if they want to drive up to the beautiful Starlight, Indiana, here in Floyd's Knobs, Indiana, how would you tell them to get here? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, if Google you uh, just use Google or uh, if you uh, use Apple uh, Maps, we are the, uh, I guess you could say, destination. Uh, our address lines up exactly with where we are. It's 19816 uh, Huber Road. Zip code 47106. 47106. Damn, that tells you how important they are. They have their own damn road. <laughs> yeah, exa- exactly. So uh, yeah. our, our address lines up exactly with uh, what you're going to be searching for on maps. Good deal, good deal. Hey, and if you all want to reach Bourbon Barrel Talk, you can hit us up on Instagram. We are Bourbon Barrel Talk. If you would look for us on Twitter, it's Bourbon Barrel T1 at uh twitter and you can find us on facebook and bourbon barrel talk at gmail.com this is scott minton josh hillman toby hatfield and the huber family here signing off thanks so much peace thank you